In this video, we're going to discuss crystal field diagrams of transition metal complexes in symmetries lower than OH and TD symmetry. Previously, we introduced the concepts behind crystal field theory, which formulates bonding between transition metals and ligands as purely electrostatic in nature, with the ligands thought of as negative point charges. Thus, the interactions between the ligands and D electrons in a transition metal complex will be repulsive in nature. Furthermore, the directionality of the D orbitals will dictate whether they are strongly or weakly destabilized by the ligands. Also, one could use symmetry arguments to derive orbital degeneracies. Thus, in an OH field, the D orbitals will be split in such a way that the dx squared minus y squared orbital and the dz squared orbital, the eg set are strongly destabilized relative to a spherical field, while the xz, yz, and xy orbitals, the t2g set, are stabilized relative to the spherical field. Energy about the spherical field center, the Berry center, is conserved so that the eg orbitals are destabilized by 6dq and the t2g orbitals are stabilized by 4dq. In contrast, in TD symmetry, one finds that the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals, the E set, are stabilized, and the dxz, dyz, and dxy orbitals, the T2 set, are destabilized relative to the spherical field. Molecules that are contained in OH and TD symmetries that are described by cubic point groups are high symmetry molecules. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand what happens if we lower the symmetry and descend out of these high symmetry point groups. So for example, what will happen if we take a molecule that's described by an OH point group and descend this into something that's described by D4H, for example? To change this from an OH to a D4H field, we can, for example, remove the axial point charges, so we'd remove the ligands along the z-axis, and create a square planar complex. We're now going to ask ourselves what has happened once we remove these axial ligands. Well, the first thing that we've done by lowering the symmetry is we, lower, we removed a lot of the degeneracies that were found in the higher symmetry point group. The dz squared now transforms as a singly um, non-degenerate A1g orbital, dx squared minus y squared is a non-degenerate B1g orbital, dxy is a non-degenerate B2g orbital, and the dxz and the dyz form a degenerate EG set. In addition, we can ask ourselves what has happened to the stabilities of these orbitals relative to the spherical field. And one thing to note is that as we've lost our interactions along the z-axis, this molecule will try to compensate for it by increasing the interactions in the xy plane. So we lose interactions along z, gain additional interactions along the xy plane. So taking to that into account, we're now going to try to think about what has been destabilized and what has been stabilized. The dz squared has been stabilized because we've lost negative charges along the z-axis. The dx squared minus y squared has become more destabilized because we're shortening those negative point charges towards those lobes, so raising the energy of that orbital relative to the OH field. The dxy is going to become more destabilized because we're bringing those point charges in closer towards those orbitals. The dxz and the dyz are going to be more stabilized because we've lost interactions along the z direction. So in general, anything that has a z term is going to become more stabilized. Anything that has an xy term is going to become more destabilized relative to the, x, relative to the OH field because of the loss of those interactions along the z axis. We're going to look at this in more detail by starting in OH symmetry and seeing what happens as we descend into D4H symmetry. So go from the higher to the lower symmetry point group. So the first thing that we're going to do is split the EG set. That splits into the A1G and the B1G. 
the B1G becomes destabilized, the A1G becomes stabilized. The T2G set splits into the B2G orbital and the EG set. So the EGs become slightly stabilized, the, P2, the B2G becomes destabilized. Because this is a crystal field model, energy of stabilization and destabilization has to be conserved about that Berry center. And if you go through and work through the mathematics involved, what you find is that the B1G orbital is destabilized by 12.28 dq, the B2G is destabilized by 2.28 dq, the A1G is stabilized by 4.28 dq, and the EG orbitals are stabilized by 5.14 dq. We'll get into where you can find these values in a second. The process that we went through using the um, point group to determine orbital degeneracies and then using the directionality that the orbitals are pointed towards relative to our negative point charges surrounding the metal center can be employed to molecules in really any coordination environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and see how this trends for different symmetries. We've already gone through and done this for both OH, 6 coordinate, and TD, 4 coordinate symmetries, so an octahedral molecule and a tetrahedral molecule. And then we did this for a square planar D4H 4 coordinate molecule. We're going to look at this for two different 5 coordinate scenarios. So one where we have a square pyramidal structure, so a five coordinate C4V field, and one where we have a trigonal bipyramidal structure, so a five coordinate D3H field. In the C4V field, what we've done is we've taken the OH molecule and we remove just one of the axial ligands, so one of the ligands along the z-axis. and what this does is it creates this type of ligand crystal field splitting diagram where we have the dx squared minus y squared still highest in energy, but now the dz squared orbital has come up in energy relative to the d4h field because we've added an axial interaction relative to the d4h field. To compensate, the b2 orbital drops in energy and the e orbitals or go up in energy higher. So the DXZ and the DYZ go up in energy relative to the D4H field because we've added a component along the Z axis. So anything with a, any orbital with the Z component is gonna be destabilized. Going to D3H symmetry, what we find now is that that dz squared orbital is now the highest in energy, it's the most destabilized because we have two interactions directly pointed along the dz squared orbital. Both the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared and the dxz and the dyz form two doubly degenerate sets, so the e prime and the e double prime orbitals. Those have energies that are fairly close to one another with the dxy and dx squared minus y squared being slightly higher in energy than the dxz and the dyz. The energy of all these orbitals are conserved about the Berry center. We've already gone through and done this for the OH field, the TD field, and the D4H field. These have been tabulated for C4V symmetry where you have very small splittings of the A1 and B2 relative to the Berry center. And this has also been done for the D3H field. It's not necessary to memorize any of these or derive them on your own. These have been tabulated and have been known for some time. So two good references where you can find them are these J. Kemet articles from the 1960s, where the crystal field splitting energies for all of these different fields have, and more than just these five different fields that I have listed here have been um, tabulated. Uh, so if you ever need these values, you can easily go and look them up. So to go through and summarize, 
As with our high symmetry cubic fields, the directionality of the d orbitals relative to the point charges are going to dictate the d orbital destabilizations and hence splittings. The degeneracy of the d orbitals will be lower than in cubic fields, and they're going to follow um, what they would based on which point group they're in. So you can use a very simple back of the envelope treatment to derive your d orbital splittings and also their relative energies relative to one another. If you happen to need a more quantitative des description of the splittings in terms of the absolute value of these dqs, um, then you can look these up because they've been um, quantitatively derived for a large number of different crystal field splittings. In the next set of videos, what we're going to do is we're going to apply this by exploring something called the spectrochemical series and try to understand the concept of a pairing energy.